we have decided that it's time we had some variety in our lives. I am humbled this morning to follow in the path of Iris and of Sister Roper, to see the beauty that is in their lives and to know them and to understand from whence they come, to look out and to see three or four, maybe more, young women that I have had close association with through the years, to know that the time has come when I must stand in the place of the older women and must impart that which has been imparted to me. I see Sister Stevens, and I remember when I was a 19-year-old mother, and she was the wife of one of my elders. And I think what a long time ago that was. That child is now nearly 35 and the mother of two. I am grateful to be here. I appreciate the opportunity of coming. I revel in the task of preparing the lesson, but I must also tell you that I am so lightheaded and so full of butterflies from nerves that I can hardly stand up here. <laughs> they tell me that you're supposed to get better about that as you go on and on, but I think perhaps one of the reasons that I am more apprehensive today is because of the topic that has been issued. I'm going to do Eddie another dirty. Where's Maxine? You don't mind, do you, Maxine? <laughs> I got the loveliest letter from Nelda telling me that I had been asked again to come and telling me what the lectureship topics were and mentioning some of the others that would be on the program, and I was thrilled to death. And at the bottom is a very nasty handwritten note signed Eddie Whitten. He said, Dear Pat, we have decided to let you come back again this year. The topic is morals in an immoral age, and I know of no one who knows more about immorality than you do. <laughs> ah, but ladies, I showed that to my six foot three son and he looked at it not knowing Eddie Whitten very well. He says, Mother, what does he mean? <laughs> Iris warned you Monday that there would be a great deal of repetition this week. There has been. The men have used our topics. The men have used our scriptures. The men have used our methods of teaching. Uh, Iris and Sister Roper didn't help a bit. They took some of my very best material. The only consolation I have, ladies, is that we will use the same book, the same text, and we come up with a... I'm sorry? Lisa Wilson, are you in here? That's fine. Evidently not. She must be in the auditorium. Well, I hope she didn't leave a child behind. <laughs> I always worry when the nursery comes looking for the mothers, you wonder what happened. Where was I? Oh, yes, they have used our material. We have heard it over and over again. Hopefully, I will be able to say a few things that the men cannot say and that Iris and Sister Roper very graciously left for me to say. My topic is a rise and escape. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there is no new thing under the sun. If you are a mother of teenagers, of young adults, a grandmother, you take comfort in that. You know that no matter what these kids do, there really is no new thing under the sun. There is still hope. There is still our God in heaven. There is still the power of prayer. There is still the power of faith. God said through Solomon, there is no new thing under the sun. As we read the account of Lot's escape from Sodom in, Sodom in Genesis 19, we note a parallel in our own lives. Our men have been telling us the parallel. Lot was in the midst of a corrupt and evil city. I cannot believe that it was basically any different than from living in Houston or Fort Worth or any major metroplex today. There are some other areas that I would like for you to note, some parallels in our lives and in Lot's. Lot was warned. He was told, flee from this city. Take your family and go. He was offered a better way. God said, you go with me. The angel said, follow us. We'll take you. We'll protect you. You will be safe. He was given instructions. And then he was given a choice. Is that so different from the world in which we live today? We live in evil, corrupt cities. We live whether they're large or small, the things that go on in our cities today will stagger the imaginations. And yet, we have been warned. We have been offered a better way. We have been given instructions, but 
our loving God has also given us the right of choice. It is our privilege to stand before our God and say, I willingly have risen up and followed after thee. Complacency I consider to be a cancer of the soul. And there has been so much cancer in our family lately, I think I'm beginning, I'm beginning to feel as though I am an expert on that. I detest cancer. I hate it. I also detest complacency in the church of our Lord today. I detest seeing our men unable to preach and our women unwilling to listen and unwilling to teach. To sit back and say, let the rest of the world do it. Let somebody else do it. I heard one beloved sister the other day say, I can't lead in public prayer, so I don't go to class because I'm afraid they'll call on me. Why? Why? Why can we not learn to do those things that are necessary? Why must we be content to sit back complacent? I don't know where she grew up. She's much older than I. I know she grew up in a time when women were not encouraged in ladies' Bible classes to pray out loud. I am not condemning her. I'm condemning those of us who have grown up in a different situation and have the opportunities and yet will complacently sit back and say, I can't do it. In Romans 12 and 2, we are admonished to be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We're besieged on all sides by those who like for us to look like them, think like them, act like them, be like them. And there's no argument against this. Conformity is fine so long as you know to what you are conforming. If it is things, if, if there are things in, in those lives that lead to the destruction of the soul, we must not be imitators of them. But rather we must look to Paul when he said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye imitators of me as I am of Christ. If we want others to be like us, to think like us, to dress like us, and act like us, then we must be imitators of that perfect example, which is Christ. We must not put ourselves in the forefront and say, look like me. I'm very grateful that not one of my three daughters is like their mother. I don't know whether the world could stand two of us. I am very grateful that they tend to take more after their grandmothers. I'm very grateful, though, that the things in me that they find to be good, they do not hesitate to imitate. I, I'm going to skip over to a different part. Robert triggered my thinking, and there's something I must say. With David, I know that my sins are ever before me. One of the reasons it is so vitally important to me today to teach, and to teach with strength, and with anger when necessary, but with intensity, is that for too many years there were years that I did not teach, that I did not study, and I did not train my own children. You must not find yourselves in that same condition. You older women, you must not let the young women in your congregations do that. There were years when I had no encouragement, when I was not being trained for a better life by the older women in the congregations. That must not happen. We must remember those sins that we committed, but we must accept the grace and forgiveness of God and go on and correct those mistakes. As Christians, we stand with Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.20 and know that because of our obedience to the law of Christ, we have been given the responsibility to teach those truths that lead to salvation. We are admonished to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. I don't know if I shared with you last year the story of my two grandsons, number two and number four, where um, when you get five, you tend to number instead of trying to call my name. But Kyle and Grady were walking with th me through um, Sackowitz in Galleria. 
and they were rather rambunctious. I was holding Grady's hand, and Kyle was holding his other hand, and they were tugging and shoving. You know, that gets to be rather distracting. Well, Stretch's best man and his wife were right behind us, and they had no children at the time, so this was a new experience. And the boys tugged enough that it was uncomfortable for Granny, and I turned at them, and I said, boys, walk circumspectly, and kept right on walking. Well, those two little boys did exactly what they were told to do. They walked circumspectly. We got to the ballpark. We were on our way to the Astrodome. We got to the ballpark, and finally Norm said, Pat, I've just got to ask you, what does walk circumspectly mean? <laughs> <laughs> he said, Denise and I looked at one another and said, are we doing this? <laughs> now, uh, I know that I have truly brilliant grandsons. They did not understand the word, but they knew Granny's tone of voice. <laughs> Let us today hear that same cry that we heard in Genesis 19, 15, 17, as they call, Arise, escape for thy life. I was discussing with Kathy this morning, I think it was Kathy this morning, somebody this morning, <laughs> early this morning. Do you think when the angels went to Lot's house and told him that the time had come when they had to arise and get out, get away from there, that they went in and said, uh, Lot, Lot, it's time to go. Do you really think that's what it is? Somehow I have a vision of a man standing there and said, get up and get out of here. Arise, escape for your life. I mean, it's fine, mothers, to go in and gently awake your children when they are lying there asleep and you want them to get up and go to school. I don't recommend just knocking them out with a clarion call every morning. But if the f house is on fire and their lives are in danger, I also do not recommend that you go in and say, Honey, honey, it's time to get busy now. Arise, awake, escape for your life. All right, and from what are we to flee? The next session I, I label current question mark problems. We go back to Solomon. There is nothing new under the sun. Are these problems any more current than they were in Genesis 6 when we read wickedness was great and every imagination or intent of the heart was evil? Do we really live in such a different society than that? Perhaps the most pervasive sin in our, country, in our society, as in every culture before us, is that of fornication. Fornication is defined by Webster as, one, human sexual intercourse other than between a man and his wife, two, sexual intercourse on the part of an unmarried person accomplished with consent and not deemed adultery. I firmly believe that that covers every form of sexual perversion, including those leading to the misuse of the body. How else do you explain all the forms of pornography, sodomy, homosexuality, lesbianism, and all forms of sadism and masochism being openly practiced today? I don't know whether it happens in your city or not. I imagine those of you who come from the smaller towns don't have this problem, but in Houston we have an area around Westheimer and Montrose that's known as the Gay Society. And almost any di given day of the week, on one newscast or another, you get a full picture of the gays as they parade their sins in front of society. They're proud of themselves. They're eager to promote themselves. We have a mayor that goes out and courts their votes because that gives her the necessary edge that she needs. We now are fighting in our government uh, legislation that will label homosexuals, lesbians as a minority and there give, thereby give them all the rights of any other minority including women and blacks. They are to be given a legal place in our society. How much sicker can a nation become after permitting that stupid, ignorant man in Austin from printing literature and dispensing literature advocating the how-tos and the joys of sex with children. Can we get any sicker than that? How can we as a nation survive if our very laws of the land are being twisted to protect those that are intent upon disrupting the very foundation upon which this nation was built? In God we trust. Does it take any great stretch of the imagination to know that if this is what we are sitting back complacently letting happen to us today, that within a few years my beloved grandsons may not have the privilege 
of attending a Christian school or of hearing unvarnished truth except in secret? Is it so far from our imaginations that we cannot see ourselves in a like society as in Poland, as in Mexico, as in Central America, where truth cannot be taught? Ladies, we have to do something about it. This form of mental and soul sickness is not limited to the secular world. It even pervades the religious world. There are gay churches or societies within organized religions. The Church of Satan, faith healers, and those who profess to be miracle workers. We must go back and study. I didn't say just read. I said we must go back and study. We must research. We must know what is taught. 1 Corinthians 16, 18. If you don't know this by heart, and I confess I do not, but we must have it written upon our hearts, at least know the thought and the intent. One version translates, don't fight, run. But your standard translations read, Flee immorality or fornication. Every other sin man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Another way of saying it is arise and escape. Run. Get away from any influence that will prohibit you from teaching and living as you ought to. While listening to Donahue one morning, and I have this in the script, let it be noted for all to understand this is not a regular habit of mine. There are a few men that I would like to see bouncing on a hot griddle. <laughs> And I think I could, with glee, watch that one do it. But I overheard what the topic of conversation was that day, and it was a study on alcoholism. And so I wrote down the statistics as they gave them. 66% of all murders, 50% of all rapes, 70% of all assaults, 80% of all suicides and 50% of all car accidents are alcohol-related. They did not give the statistics on child or uh, spouse mental abuse, but it must be staggering. Right uh, just oh, two or three weeks ago, we had a young man speak to us at Galena Park, and he is a foster care parent. He is working with a private organization. He is not church-oriented, but he is a preacher of the gospel, and he and his wife for many years did foster care work within the church. In Harris County alone, that grand and glorious county to the south of us, 56,000 children. Hear me, ladies. 56,000 children are in foster care in Harris County alone. How many of those are there because of alcohol? There are now, now 10 million known alcoholics in the United States. The reason I have gone to the trouble to document this on alcoholism, one of the reasons that, that I bothered to put it in the book is because we have in the Brotherhood today men who are teaching that Christ taught only temperance, not abstinence. I quoted Mayor Louis, uh, former Mayor Louis Welch, who is now president of the Chamber of Commerce in Houston, because I happen to have personal experience with him. A number of years ago, my eldest daughter was in high school, and a picture of Mayor Welch came out on the front page of the Houston Post in which he was holding a glass of champagne and was toasting a visiting dignitary. It was only a few months, either before or after that, that he had also come out on the front page of the uh, alumni newspaper from Abilene Christian University lauding him as an outstanding student. And yet here he was with a glass of champagne for all of the people who get the Houston Post to see. My daughter wrote him a letter, and she asked, Dear Brother Welch, do you think it proper for you to have your uh, to put yourself in this type of situation knowing that there are so many young people looking to you as an example? I did not bring the letter he wrote back, 
But it was ugly. It was curt. It was rude. It was unkind. And for all these years, at least uh, 13 years, Lee's been 14 years, Lee's been out of high school, that has been there. That's the picture we have of this man who is our brother in Christ. I thought, well, before I include him, in this article, I wanted to check with him, so I called him. On August 21st, 1984, at 4.45 p.m. Now, is that documentation or not? I got it, ladies. <laughs> I asked him if he had changed his stance from 14 years ago, and he says, why should I? And I said, well, uh, <clears throat> I said, in light of the statistics and the information that's out is out now on the consequences of alcoholism and the use of alcohol in our society, I thought perhaps you had rethunk your position and had come to the conclusion that you as a Christian must take a stand against it. He said, oh, certainly not, certainly not. And I said, um, I'm sure you won't recall. I, oh, ladies, I struggled. Oh, I, st I was so good. I said, I know you will not recall a letter written to you by a young teenager, and I Procedure count. He said, I certainly do remember it. I wish I could get the tone of voice he used. I certainly do remember it. I got a lot of flack about that. And I said, well, uh, would you do the same thing again? Well, certainly. There was nothing wrong. And I said, oh. And then he went on to say, and I read this, Mr. Welch says he holds the same position and no prejudiced fuddy-duddy will change his mind. <laughs> he contends it is a matter of his conscience and not anyone else's prejudices. He also said, and I thought this was very wise of him, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 should read, avoid evil where it appears. And the logical conclusion to that then is, so if evil is not apparent, we can take part. Well, you see, it wasn't evil to this other head of state to be drinking champagne. As a matter of fact, it was accepted. I mean, everybody knows that when you give a state dinner, you must serve your wines. For some reason, Jimmy Carter didn't think that was necessary. He said it's not apparent, so therefore we can take part. He also went on to say that he does protest the misuse of alcohol, sex, dope, or anything else. So, wise woman that I am... <laughs> I went to a higher authority, and I called my young preacher friend. I said, David, I am not a Greek student. I need a literal translation of 1 Thessalonians 5.22. This is what we came up with. I, won't, I don't know the Greek. I obviously cannot pronounce the words. But I will give you what uh, David gave to me. Meanings are from Thayer's Greek lexicon. The word abstain is the imperative mood, which means it is a command. Now, Louis Welch, irregardless, my dear friends, whatever preacher, whatever man, whatever woman, whoever stands before you and says Christ taught only temperance, not abstinence, must answer 1 Thessalonians 5.22 because we are commanded. It is not a suggestion. Here again, listen to the voices. He doesn't say, now look, if it's convenient and if you feel like it, then I think maybe you ought to take a stand against social drinking. What did he say? Can you see our Lord... By the way, could you see Paul pussyfooting around an issue like that? Uh, Iris, I have to tell you something. I'm going to put this on public record. The first time I heard Johnny, I went home and I said, I know what the Apostle Paul looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm so enamored of Johnny, I'm not sure I really want to meet Paul. And <laughs> But can you imagine Paul pussyfooting around when he's teaching young men in his class, young women in his class about this? What did he say? He said, it is a command. Flee fornication. Avoid the very appearance of evil. What is another way of saying it? Arise and escape. I had a question for Mr. Welch. I didn't ask him. <clears throat> Those advocators are, of social are just a little drink. Would they also advocate just a little adultery on the part of their wife? Would they advocate just a little theft on the part of their sons? Or lying or fornication? Lot's wife wanted just a little peek. Moses 
use just a little misuse of authority. Uzzah was going to help just a little. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is no such thing as a little bit of sin when you are a willing participant in it. My daddy used to tell me there is no such thing as a little white lie. Either you tell the truth or you don't. My daddy also used to tell me that when uh, Scripture said women are keep silence in the churches, that means you keep your mouth shut. (laughs) I think you can tell by that I was raised by a very stern father. I don't know what happened along the way. If one drink can start alcoholism, and this is documented, if one drink can start you on the road to alcoholism or abuse or murder, then why take the chance? Why sit back complacently and let your children grow up in a society thinking that it's all right to take one little drink? Why do we sit in ladies' Bible classes and not discuss these issues? Let me tell you something, ladies, and you hear me well. If our men will not teach it, we must. If our men do not have the courage of their convictions and will not stand in the pulpit and preach against sin, then we as women of God must be teaching those principles that God has given to us too. We must be able to see the difference. And because the world says it's all right, does not make it right for a Christian. We must know where we stand. We are by choice set apart for a better purpose than pleasing men. And if this choice was not a knowing choice, then we need to grow up into Christ, Ephesians 4.15, and make that a knowledgeable commitment. You cannot be tolerant of nor participate in sin and love the Savior, Luke 6.13. It's heartbreaking to learn of more and more once strong, active members of the Lord's Church going off over pseudo or neo-Pentecostalism. Why would they leave their first love to go after false gods? Now this comes home especially hard to me because the mother of one of my sons, sons sons-in-law, has done this. She and her two daughters have left the body of Christ and have gone off into Pentecostalism. The reasons she gave me, and listen to this, you'll know why I say my sins are ever before me. One of the reasons she gave me was your prejudicial attitude, your judgmental conduct. As I stand before my God, I tell you, ladies, it was never intentional. I did not know that when you stand for truth and when you try to teach that which is truth, that you are going to be accused of it. But I know that in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, we are told that that type of accusation must be false for us to be pleasing to God. She said she was sick and tired of going to congregations where people were dead, where they didn't know that Christ was alive, where she felt no excitement about the services. Well, I can tell you one reason why she didn't go is because she never felt any excitement. Why she didn't feel this is because she never felt any excitement herself. I challenge you to read the Word of God on a daily basis seeking excitement and knowledge and love and truth and not get excited about it. How can we possibly not get excited? Some of them want to go because they have lost their first love. Some want to go, they seek a faith that permits them to do as they please rather than be pleasing to God or do as God wills. Their condemnation is found in Proverbs 14 and 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some, like Simon in Acts 8, are looking for more excitement, and they've gone after the physical evidence of God who is alive rather than one who speaks to the heart. It's not hard for me to understand why so many are disheartened, disillusioned today. We have pulpits that are occupied by men who are more interested in salary, security, and position, and popularity than ringing out warnings against sin and the consequences thereof. I don't want you to think that I am just picking on our brethren today. I'm not, because they have wives, and they have daughters, and they have elder women who ought to be reminding them of the fact that their responsibility is to teach that which must be taught. So long as we have elders who are unwilling or unable to shepherd a flock, so long as we are sheep who are not willing to be sheep, so long as we have men, husbands, and fathers who have abdicated their God-given role, so long as we have women, and God help us when we are this way, who try to wrest that from God which he did not give to us, we will have trouble. 
The only solution is to arise and escape, to study, to know that which is taught in Scripture that is our responsibility, that for which we will have to answer. We are now facing a generation of children who are ignorant of the consequences of sin because they have not been taught what constitutes sin. How many of you can look at your young adult children today and say, did you not know that that is a sin? And they look back at you and say, what are you talking about? My beloved son, Stretch, was singing a song one day. We were driving down the road, and I wasn't really listening to what he was singing, but it was a song that says, um, I may not get to heaven, but I've been to Texas. Now, that's nice. I mean, you know, all of us love Texas. And he said, you know, Mom, there are some people that would say that's sacrilegious. And I said, well, look at who you're talking to. And so we went over the song. And he said, but Mother, that's so one way. Hey, my son's 29 years old. He's six foot three, but I can still kick him in the shins when he makes statements like that. I can still tell him, son, you better go back and research. You go to a Willie Nelson concert, you better know what you're getting into. I can no longer say you may not do it. I, can no, I no longer have the freedom for, to forbid him that. When he left my home, he, he got rid of me that way. But I do have the obligation as an older woman in Christ to remind him and to tell him, you better think about it. I have the right and the privilege to look at my daughters and say, you were brought up differently than that. You know better. I made a mistake. I repented of it. I asked your forgiveness. I told you I had lived in error. Now, you better do better than I do. My mother very wisely told me one time, if you not, are not a better woman than I, then I have lived in vain. Ladies, this is our obligation. The next generation must be better than we are or we have lived in vain. If we end up in the next generation with the same identical numbers of unfaithful, unlearned, uneducated women in the Lord's church, why have we lived? Of what purpose were we? The family as God intended it is almost unknown today. We've gone over that. I'm going to skip. As Ira said, you got to listen faster than you ever have before. It is Satan who entices us to sin. I, I have heard women, my sisters in Christ, say, God tempted me. God does not tempt. He permits you to be tempted. Why? Because he gave you the right of free moral choice. He said, Pat Subi, you have a mind, use it. You have eyes, read. You have a heart to hear, hear. Know what is the will of God. If we have weak families today, it is because somewhere, sometime has not taught what the family ought to be. My primary concern as an older woman, and oh, how I do hate to use that term. I was never going to reach 53. <clears throat> My primary concern as an older woman today is to teach the younger women, right? This is a direct command from God. God did not say, Pat, you go knock doors and campaigns. God did not say, now, Pat, you get in the pulpit and you preach. God did not say, Pat, it's up to you to write all the literature for the Brotherhood to publish. But he put me in a position where I have a wife, fortune, uh, I have a wife, I have a husband. <laughs> you know, maybe that's a Freudian slip. Maybe I wanted to be a husband more than I thought I did. <laughs> I honestly, I told, told you yesterday, I have never, I can honestly say I've never wanted to be a man. And then I come out with a statement like that. <laughs> God put me in a husband, in in gave me a husband. I'll get it right in a minute. God gave me a husband. He gave me four children and five grandsons to teach. I had better be teaching them before I even consider teaching anyone else. Are our men weak because we want them to be weak? Do they lack strength because we have not supported them in the things that they want to do? Do we want our, so badly for our husbands to be a high position in the world today that we are willing to sacrifice ourselves and our children on the altars of immodest dress, drink, social uh, activities of which a Christian should have no part? Are we willing to do that just so we can go one step higher on the corporate ladder? You know where we're going, don't you? We may reach the top of the corporate ladder, but let me tell you, it is a slide to the bottom when you get to Judgment Day. It is never my intention to point a finger in accusation. That's one reason why I shared with you before, that I live every day with the knowledge of the sins I committed in ignorance. 
not all of them in ignorance, of sins that I committed knowingly. I live with those because I know, as did David, that the repercussions are going to be felt because I made an immoral choice. I don't want you to think that I'm looking at any one of you and pointing and saying, you did it. But I want rather for us to open our hearts together and say, sisters, it is time for us to take a stand as true women of God, to stand with our shoulders back and our heads high and say, I am proud to be a Christian. I want that grace of God. I want that forgiveness. I want that acknowledgement that I can from this day forward be everything God intended me to be. Perhaps we have burdened ourselves with crosses of guilt for actions long ago repented of and forgotten by God. Are we so fearful of losing favor in others' eyes that we close our eyes to error? When we read 1 Thessalonians 5.22, what does it say to us? When I sit down and I read that, I should be able to hear the voice of God saying to me, abstain from every form or appearance of evil. I shouldn't have to say, hey, that goes for you, Sister Ward. Don't, don't, don't you forget now, that applies to you. It is talking to me. It is intimidating to me to be around Abella Absig or Betty Friedan. And, you know, honestly, ladies, if I thought I looked like those women did, I'd be afraid to ask for equal rights. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really think I would prefer the bald head <laughs> that was promised in song. I, I don't... I, I am not intimidated by, by the, truly, by the antagonistic women that uh, advocate equal rights. But I am fearful of those that slip it in slyly, that kind of come in the back door, and you pick up a magazine, you start reading it, and all of a sudden, wait a minute, and you back up, and somebody well-known is talking about open marriage? Ooh, I hope nobody ever tells Suba that you're supposed to have an open marriage. He would lock my door real fast. <laughs> like reading you find on all the stands, magazines that our children can pick up and look at if they're not even old enough to read it. My Suba does, is not a reader. He ordered a book the other day, the title of which is How to Get Even. <laughs> I don't know what we have in store when he retires. <laughs> But I thought, oh, that's so clever. I'll just pick it up and read it. I read two chapters, and I threw it down. I said, Suba, that man is sick. And I said, furthermore, if you're going to keep the book in the house, you put it up where not one of our grandsons can ever find it because Kyle can read. And not only can he read, but he could understand what was being said in that book. Then there's another thing, and this is a per another personal experience. If we have anyone here who is offended by personal experiences, I'm sorry. I'm the best example I know. <laughs> The things that I have seen and suffered and recognized in myself, I know. I can't tell what goes on in your lives, and I cannot speak in generalities. But this is happening to me now. There's a young woman to whom I'm very close. We walk at 10 till 6 every morning. We walk a mile. She is a preacher's wife, daughter of an elder, brought up in the church, fantastic Bible class teacher, one of the best visual aids women I've ever seen in my life. And yet she habitually uses God in her conversation. And she uses some of the other euphemisms that we talked about, that one of our men talked about the other day. I heard it a couple of times, and I thought, this can't be. This, you know, there's something wrong with my hearing. And finally I said, do you realize what you're saying? And she said, oh, well, I worked in a hospital in Dallas for several years, and I guess I just got used to it, and I don't realize that I'm saying it. No repentance, no turning away from it, because she still does it. Now, I have a choice to make. <laughs> Do I accept the role of elder woman and say, now, look here, young lady, you are young enough to be my child, therefore you pay attention. I tell you what I better do. I better do as those angels did in Genesis and knock on their door and bang on her door and say, you better wake yourself up and escape from this habit. But we're told that these things are the new freedom. We're liberated. We don't have to any longer be tied down by those old mores of biblical <laughs> society. Let me repeat. There is nothing new under the sun. The attitudes and answers must still be found in the book, Isaiah 5, 20 and 23. Arise and escape is a command to do something. 
You can't lay in bed and hear the call arise and escape and lay there and snuggle back into your pillow and be acceptable. It is a command to move it. That means get on your feet. Do something. Maybe you run in the wrong direction, but at least run. We have women today who sit down and they say, Oh, yes, I know we live in an evil and corrupt and degenerate society. What can I do? And they're like the woman I read about who sat down in the middle of the road and waited for the bus to run over her. <laughs> we say that and then we go into our homes and we close our doors and we insulate and we isolate so that we won't be touched by the world around us. We can't do that either. Now, God has the ultimate solution, but until he decides to destroy the earth with fire, we are faced with the problem of living in but not of this world. Read carefully 2 Corinthians 6, 17. We are admonished to separate ourselves from that which is unclean if we desire to walk with God. Our Father is a jealous God, and he will not inhabit the same area as the evil one. Rather, he says, we must cleanse our hearts and minds and seek to live untainted lives. The only way to fight against conformity to the world is to put on the full armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, Ephesians 6, 11. Search the scriptures. Study to show yourself approved. Use every avenue that is open to you to fight against those who would entice you to error. Pray, study, neglect not the, any opportunity for edification. Be always aware of the temptations that surround you. Commit thy way unto the Lord, Psalms 37, 5. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established, Proverbs 16, 3. Those are not passive commands or suggestions. They denote action. That means get up and go. It's easy to be passive. It's easy to isolate ourselves. It's far easier to go inside and close the door than it is to get out and mix and mingle with what's out there. I have a plaque in my kitchen that says, No problem is solved when we idly wait for God to undertake full responsibility. That's a reminder to me that if I leave the dishes, they'll be there when I get back. If I don't make the beds, they're not going to make themselves. I don't have a Samantha who, by the twitch of her nose, can uh, correct all of my errors. God didn't put us here because he thought we were so good and sweet and beautiful that we could handle anything. He put us here to work out our own salvation, Philippians 2.12. He put us here not to judge others by ourselves, but to judge ourselves by the standards which he gave us for, to mature into perfection. Just like Lot, he gave us the choice. For over two weeks, I was absolutely, totally, completely fascinated with the Summer Olympics. No longer do I think about the pixiness of Kathy Rigby, Olga Corbett, and, Nel and uh, Nadia Comaneci. But I'm telling you, Mary Lou Retton will forever have a place in my heart. I can see her, I can close my eyes, and I can see that body vaulting through the air, twisting and turning. Absolute discipline, absolute concentration. I think this is what we must do. I decided there are probably three things that an uh, Olympian does that are necessary to us. They are daring, dedication, and discipline. They do these because they want the gold crown, the gold symbol of the Olympic Games. We do it because we want a gold crown of life. We do it because we want stars in our crown. We do it because we want to walk with Christ and with the apostles and with all those beautiful women who have gone before us. Dare to be different. Our Lord prayed in, in John 17, 15, I pray not that thou wouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. And in Matthew 5, 14 and 16, let your light shine. Ye are the light of the world. Let your light shine. We all know the power of one candle in total darkness. We are to be candles. I was telling the other night, uh, I love staying at Maxine's because when you get up in the middle of the, of the night and go in to turn the coffee pot on, you know that she has kept her house in order so you don't stumble over anything. You can walk in absolute darkness and there's a light on her microwave. A little teensy tiny red pinpoint of a light. Maxine is the kind of homemaker and housekeeper that you know you're not going to stumble, and that light is a beacon. Basil Barrett Baxter wrote, It is not enough to stand aloof from the sins of the world. The Christian must exert an influence that will cause others to withstand the influence of evil about them. We know that we here today may have been chosen for such a time as this that we may stand as lights in a dark world. It is our opportunity to exert influence. Dare to be different. Where there is hatred, be loving. Where there is anger, be calm. Where there is immodesty, be modest. 
Where there is immorality, be moral. Where there is fear, radiate hope. But most of all, where there is mortality, seek immortality. Dedicate yourself to the task at hand. Work to transform yourself by the renewing of your mind. It requires commitment. It is discipline that enables us to rejoice in the Lord again, and I say rejoice, Philippians 4, 4. If our minds are to be controlled, to seek those things which are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, vir virtuous, and praiseworthy, Philippians 4 and 8, we must exercise a constant, consistent discipline. Proverbs 11.22 tells us that a beautiful woman without discretion or discipline is like a ring of gold in a pig's snout. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 9.27, I buffet my body and I make it my slave lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul never underestimated the discipline needed to be different for the Lord's sake. Nor did he fail to remind us that all the glory and the joy of heaven are ours if we but want it badly enough. We are to be not wise in our own conceits, Romans 12, 16, but we are to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, draw nigh unto God so that he can draw nigh unto us, James 4, 7 and 8. In this world of the haughty, covetous, disobedient, lovers of pleasure, blasphemers, deniers of God, and despisers of those that are good, 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4, we must dare to be different. We must dedicate ourselves to the transforming of our minds, and we must discipline ourselves with the help of God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit to let our light shine. And as day follows night, all that will be good will be ours. Once again, I say, ladies, it's time to awake, to arise, and to escape. Thank you.